Hello, I'm Jeff Scheidach, Dean of Students at Calvin Theological Seminary, and recently I was honored to host a conversation between Mark Braverman and Gary Burge about Israel and Palestine and about the ongoing violence in Gaza. Mark Braverman is a Jewish American with family roots in Israel. He's a retired clinical psychologist. He serves as the executive director of Kairos USA, a movement to unify and mobilize American Christians to work for a just peace in Israel and Palestine. Gary Burge is an adjunct professor of New Testament here at Calvin Theological Seminary, and he's an expert on the integration of theology and politics in the Middle East. Both of these men have written books about Israel and Palestine, and you can find information about them in the description below. I sat down with Mark and Gary for this conversation on October 31st, 2023, just two and a half weeks after Hamas' attack on Israel and as Israel's ongoing retaliation continued in Gaza. These two experts help unpack the history, politics, and theology of the land and help us to understand the current conflict and how we can respond. In this part of the conversation, Mark and Gary discuss God's promises to Old Testament Israel and how they should be understood today, especially in light of the rise of Zionism in the last century. Why are the promises important? Why are the promises just the, because of, of God Abraham? made? Just, yes, yeah. just because God made them. Are there other, as another? Re, are there any well, other reasons why Christians would want to hold on to the promises of? of well, there are two questions there. Why are they important in terms of biblical theology? Why are they important to Judaism? That's one question, mm -hmm. and then um, they are so intrinsic to Jewish thought right through the first century. I mean, this is the basis of the fight for the, Jew the first Jewish war of AD sixty six. So um, my ethnicity, my religious identity are geographically located in a land. And I thread all of that back to Abraham. So it's, it's impossible for me to separate any of those three. Um, we see this in a lot of places in the world. The Serbians, um, I can get rid of this. The Serbians actually have the same idea that I have to live in Serbia. So mm -hmm. or you go anywhere in the world. Um, Americans are strangely uh, Keep going. located outside of space. We move around the country all the time. We even move to other states, right. other countries. So anyway, so so anyway, um, it's important to Judaism because they do have a notion of religious space, and that's why the holy place. I mean, you, you, Israel, Jerusalem, temple. Mm -hmm. Uh, Israelite courts, holy space, holy of holies. You have this ascending, and it's all geographical. It's all location. You're always aliyah. You're going up all the time. So um, what's revolutionary is the New Testament comes along and says, yeah, we acknowledge that, but we're pulling two things out of the equation. And I think it's actually, it's, it, you have hints of this in Jesus, but really it's Paul who does the rearranging. Mm -hmm. And that's because he has this amazing moment seeing that God wants us to go to the Gentiles. So therefore the ethnicity piece drops out and the geography piece drops out. Mm -hmm. So you have a rearranging of the spiritual geography, you might say of God's people. Mm -hmm. And then you have a rearranging of ethnic exclusivity for God's people. Right. So, so that leaves the last leg of the stool. And that is that your relationship, you, you too, anyone, you too, both you and Jeff can be called sons of Abraham, even though you both have completely different bloodlines. So if that's the case, you have a small revolution in Jewish identity. And I, I, I think that's a very, very big pill for most Jews to swallow. Um, if you see this embedded especially in Stephen's very long speech in Acts 7 and 8, mm -hmm. because what he's doing is he is separating religious identity from nation. From nation. And, and that's what gets him stoned. It gets him killed. It the Jews him killed him. Killed. Right. right. Just as if you were to go to Jerusalem and say, this is not your holy land, it would probably get you. Well, what would happen to you if you were at the Damascus Gate and you said something like that? You'd be in trouble. Yeah, probably a passerby would. Smack you, you would you you'd be in trouble. More trouble than that. So yeah. so when you when you dislodge someone, Americans are the same way. I mean, do we have a sense of national 
spiritual identity in this place? There are a lot of Americans who say, of course, this is God. God gave us this land. God gave America a mission unlike any other nation in the world. How's that sound? God's blessing us if we mm-hmm. do the yeah, right very thing. Very similar stuff. It's very similar stuff. Yeah. So if you question religious nationalism in America, you're going to get extreme pushback in the same way. Because it's being a bad American. Yeah. And being a yeah. American. And also it's being a bad Christian. And being a bad Both. Yeah. So you are dislodging someone's um, heartfelt worldview. This is how they understand reality. And if you begin to dismantle it, mm. it it's painful. Right, so this is really this is really important what you're saying because <clears throat> you're making a distinction between um, Christians and Jews with yeah. with respect to this. Yeah. So yeah. for Christians, I would say, because my question was, why are the promises to Abraham, father of the Jews, well, ultimately the father of us all, about a particular piece of territory important to Christians? Right, okay. And it's easy for a Christian sitting in America or in Belgrade or in London or in Paris <clears throat> or in Johannesburg yeah. to say, yeah, I accept the promises because I'm not living here. It has no implications for me no. and my life, no. my security or anything. No. I just buy it because it's the word of God and it's it's a fundamental thing. Yeah. In some ways. And it's the also- Jews do it for me. Yeah. We send them there and they can live there. That's right. And it's important for me as a as a non-Jew for the Jews to live there and to fulfill that. To yeah, cash so in that, that for Christianity has always had a very strong, evangelicals especially, a strong eschatological line. Yep. So therefore, um, throughout the 20th century, especially after World War I, it all flourishes. Um, everything from the devastation of World War I to the Spanish flu to the collapse of the economic markets, all of this gives – Americans a sense of despair about the future. And so therefore what you have is all of this uh, revival preaching all over America. It's fascinating in which eschatology plays a big part. We're coming to the end of time. We're coming to, Jesus is coming back soon. And the key piece is look at Jews are migrating back to the Holy land. So therefore you have this whole eschatology that is helping me to be at peace given the uh, disarray of the world. So for a lot of Christians, um, uh, even today, even today, um, I have been in conversation with evangelicals who say, I'm not worried about the war in Gaza because this is God's plan. He is cleansing the Holy Land of Canaanites. Um, Gaza will be raised. I've been given Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 4 more than once. It literally says Gaza will be raised. Never mind that Gaza has been raised probably a dozen times uh, in the last 3,000 years. <laughs> but still, they say, this is now a fulfillment of prophecy. Therefore, I can take comfort. The world is not coming apart. Uh, history is unfolding exactly the way God predicted it. And the Israelis are instruments of God's um, plan. So that's a major ingredient of Christian Zionism. Oh, it is. Um, which was really hatched in England. And then you have the Balfour Declaration and all of that. Right. Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah. The Balfour Declaration is, of course, there's uh, British Zionists are pressuring that kind of yeah. thing to yeah. come about. But also there are British evangelicals in the early 20th century who, who also want to see this kind of realization of what they believe are end of the world, end of time promises. This was one part of the conversation between Mark and Gary. If you'd like to hear more, you can click on the next part of the conversation, or you can click on the full conversation.